Hi everyone, hi, hi. Okay, so today, today what are we doing? What I'm gonna be doing today is I'm going, to, I'm going to be talking about 22 classics that I want to read in 2022. My process of picking these classics were, um, was this. I walked around my house and I picked up all of the books that looked interesting that <laughs> it's a very mood readery process. So what I did is that I walked around and browsed my shelves and I thought about what, is, what do I really want to read this coming year based on my mood right now. And I gathered up a bunch of books that I have purchased or I have languishing on my shelves and um, they've been sitting in a pile. There have been more than 22 so I've had to whittle it down a little bit and um, I've been just looking at them, looking through them, looking them up, all of these classics. And so this is really um, a mood reader's plan <laughs> for the future. Now, if you don't know what a mood reader is, a mood reader is somebody who, who picks what they want to read based on what they feel like reading. So if something, if they feel they read about a thriller and that sounds really good in the moment, typically a mood reader will pick up that book. Or if they're in the mood for a coming of age story, then they'll pick up a coming of age story and so on and so forth. And so I am a huge mood reader. I base my reading off of my mood. So it's really kind of interesting to plan for 2022, to plan for the future based on my mood right now, because I'm not going to be, I'm not sure if I'm going to be in the mood to read these books in six months from now. So it's kind of a, a bit of an experiment <laughs> to see if I actually read um, all of these books or if I will c maintain the mood to read these books. Um, and so what this, this video is, is a bit of a time capsule. I can go in the future, at the end of 2022 or midway through or three months in, I can look back on myself in this moment today, December 9th, I believe, um, and, and say, hey, is that what I really, is that, did you really want to read that? And, and really question myself for the future. So this is a bit of a time capsule. I'm talking about classics and I'm reading off of my shelves um, solely based on my mood. So if you are new to my channel, then hi, I'm Shelly. I am a huge fan of reading. It is my main gig, my big hobby. I love interacting with humanity in this way. And in this, in this way, um, it, I feel like I'm exploring art. I'm exploring different voices. I'm walking in other people's shoes. And there is just a thrill and an excitement <laughs> and um, a process of learning that reading gives that almost nothing else can do. Um, it's just a truly unique experience. So if you like videos like this that talk about classics, that talk about reading, and that talk about reading based on one's mood, um, or time capsule videos, um, then, then, you know, I would encourage you to subscribe because that's what we're all about. Or if you just like super cute little pups, um, like my pup Harry right here, don't you growl, don't you growl, then um, you can also subscribe for that. Okay, so let's talk about the 22 books, 22 classics that I want to read in 2022. But before we get into it, I want to give credit where credit is due. I saw Eric Carl Anderson has a backlog of this kind of video. So he had 19 classics to read in 2019, 20 classics to read in 2020, 21 classics to read in 2021. He is a booktuber here with the sweetest spirit. Um, he is just soft-spoken and just there is this aura of kindness that he carries with him that um, that is really um, magnanimous, like you are just drawn to him. And, uh, and so he has done a series of these videos on his channel and I really got the idea from him. Um, so I, I just wanted to credit Eric Carl Anderson who is just the king, the king of this corner of booktube. Um, okay, so I have broken my books into categories and I'm going to start with translated fiction translated classics and to no surprise a lot of them are going to be old old pieces of literature so I'm not only just starting with translated classics but I'm going to be um, they are also the oldest pieces of literature 
so we first have four plays by Aristophanes. I read Lysistrata, which is one of the plays in here. Um, it is, you know, speculated that Aristophanes wrote this between 445, is that right? 445 uh, to 375 BC. And there are three plays that are unread by me in here. Um, they're, they're comedies, so there is um, a quirkiness to it. There is also um, the, the exploration of humanity and politics that Aristophanes likes to write about. And so I'm really excited to revisit this ancient, ancient Greek um, and get to know uh, him more. I'll try and... There we go. Okay, the next one is Socrates. Um, Socrates, the Oedipus, Oedipus the King. This is the famous story of a young prince who kills his father because he is in love with his mother. Um, a trope, a tropey classic, and um, I, I wanted to read the origins of that trope, so that's why this made the list. Again, an ancient Greek work. My final ancient Greek work is an epic poem, and uh, this is already a plan to read it with my, my book club that I have with David Wiley, the Eclectic Book Club, and that is The Odyssey by Homer. Again, an ancient Greek text um, that has many, many translators. I am currently reading the Fitzgerald translation. Oh, give me a moment. My nose is um, having a time with the cold weather. I just came in from the cold. And so, um, so it's just having some, some issues, um, not sick or anything though. But so this is, you know, the story of Od Odysseus who is on this journey. And like many journeys, you encounter, um, in unique individuals and <laughs> trials and tribulations along the way. And then, you know, using the skills that the character has in order to overcome or to make it through those trials and tribulations. So an epic poem, um, and I'm, I am really excited to read this with a group because um, the group has proven very helpful during my read of the Iliad. Okay, leaving um, the ancient Greeks and moving over to France, I have this um, modern library book, which is really uh, charming with this pink and this blue and it's um, Canidad. <laughs> this is a satire, um, a satire uh, that plays on the, it is an argument against optimism. Yes, like being optimistic, it is an argument against that. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited to get to this because I have been reading Catherine the Great and she was highly influenced by the Enlightenment period and by Voltaire in particular. So this is this is really kind of reached the tippy top of my list since I have been reading Catherine the Great by Robert K. Massey. All right, two more translated novels to go, one of which is an epic tome, and that is War and Peace. Um, this is by, you know, the Russian author Leo Tolstoy, and it is a sweeping novel. It covers uh, many years, many characters' lives, and it, you know, it's a bit hard for me to categorize not, categorize not having read it. Um, but I know that it is, it is a sweeping epic novel. I'm like stumbling over my words because I'm so excited to read it. And I know that a lot of people have been making plans here on booktube to read this in the future. And I know that I will definitely be part of someone's plan, someone's group to read it. I'm really excited about this. Okay, my final translated novel, which is a perfect bridge in between um, my category of translated <laughs> fiction and my category of children's fiction or um, young people's fiction, which you will recognize a bunch of these titles, by the way. Um, they're very, very familiar. So this one is Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I did want to get to this in... Um, in what is it, New World's November, but I just did it. It's this gorgeous softbound cover copy. 
And this is the, the classic Verne style where he really mixes sci-fi with an adventure story. And I don't know much beyond that, but that is very much uh, Jules Verne's style and the thing that he is most known for. Okay, so like I said, um, this is also considered like a children's or a young person's book. Um, this adventure story mixed with sci-fi set in the ocean and exploring the ocean floor, I suppose. Um, and so going along with that, I have other children's, they're like children's classics, but they're young adult novels, novels that talk about the coming of age story or that deal with uh, children protagonists, okay? So this is the most modern of my modern classics. It was really written about, you know, 15 years ago, but it is being taught in high schools today. So I feel like the chance for it to be a true classic in 50, 60, 100 years from now um, is growing because it's being taught in high school today. And that is John Boyne's uh, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, which is about, uh, it's set in, in World War II, and I know that it deals with, um, I believe concentration camps. Um, I've heard that this is a heartbreaking novel and I think it explores friendship, but I don't know that much about it. I'm really excited to get to this because I have heard it's one of those stories that really sticks with you. Okay, written in 1949, but take, it takes place in the 30s um, in England and it's I Capture the Caps the Castle by Dottie Smith. Um, this tells the story about 17 year old Cassandra who is use, trying to bolster her writing skills while she's living in a ramshackled old castle in the countryside of England, I believe. And um, she, in this notebook, she accounts six months of her life. So this really feels like a slice of life kind of book but in that age bracket where she falls in love for the first time. So I'm really, this is, sounds just like the kind of book that I love. And so I'm very thrilled to get to this uh, sooner rather than later. All right, moving from Europe to back to the, uh, the Americas in Canada, we have Anne of Green Gables by L.M. Montgomery. Uh, this is the, a, a classic story of a hard-headed orphaned girl who gets adopted by older parents. Um, the people who adopt her are a little bit older and now she's living in a, um, in a small town and trying to find her way and her place in this society. Um, again, another very much slice of life kind of book. Um, I have watched the whole mini series, the very famous one. Um, I'll try and link it down below. And the one that sticks pretty closely to the novels, but I've never read the novel. And um, I'm excited to get to know Anne and her stubbornness and her um, strong-willed temperament. Um, it, this was one of my sister's favorite books as a kid. Okay, moving backward in time a little bit and yet another female protagonist. But this is Lewis Carroll's um, Alice in Wonderland, which tells the story about Alice who tumbles through the, she, you know, she falls into another world basically um, as she's chasing a rabbit. Though I, this is gonna be a reread for me. It's in this gorgeous hardbound copy with this inlaid gold and it has stunning illustrations to it. So. I'm peeping behind it to make sure it focuses. Um, but I, I haven't, I don't remember a lot about it, but I know that I've read it. And so this will be a reread for me as um, Alice makes her way through the wild and wacky underworld um, that she finds herself in after chasing a talking rabbit. Okay, now we are moving to a very, very, very famous um, young person's classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by um, C.S. Lewis. And it is all about four children who find a magical world through their 
wardrobe. Um, in the back of their wardrobe, it opens up to a magical world, and there they go on an adventure. Um, I read one of C.S. Lewis's um, books in this series last year, and I absolutely despised it, so I'm hoping it goes better for me with this one this year. This is a reread, but I don't know how I'll um, react to it as an adult. And then finally, um, a book about friendship and nature, and that is Frances Hodgson, Hodgson's Burnett's of a Secret Garden. Um, and I am excited to see how young people navigate um, through their sort of self-centered lives um, while also uh, exploring or discovering the beauty and magic of nature. Okay, so those are all of my young people's classics. Again, very notable, very recognizable. Now we're going to move to Gothic. <laughs> Specifically, I have one Gothic, true, you know, Gothic, true Gothic novel, and then I have one Southern Gothic collection of short stories. So we will do the Gothic, Gothic one first, and that is, oh, one, one moment. All right, I had to do a couple things. Um, I had to sort out my nose and then slide my books over and um my camera was um running low on memory so i hope things didn't change too much but i was just about to talk about gothic works so this is oh wrong way mary shelley's frankenstein which i haven't read but i know this got a lot of buzz on booktube especially around victober just because it is such a, a classic um Victorian novel and it's you know perfect for Halloween though I know it's really its central message is that of empathy so I um, I'm excited to get to this I've, I've really kind of my interest has been piqued and I'm ready to to dive in all right and then my other gothic but it's going to be southern gothic if you don't know what southern gothic uh, literature is it plays on the the tropes of gothic literature so scary settings grotesque characters but it also um, deals with the themes of the south so a lot of times it talks about the theme of race and the setting is in the south and so it has more of that sometimes swamp like um setting that um and the it you know, there's a lot of dynamics in regards to class and um, and relational. So it is, it's a play, it's a subgenre of, of gothic literature, not actual, it's its own genre outside of gothic literature that uses those same tropes, but in a Southern setting. And there are characteristics very, very much that are um, attained to Southern gothic. I am not an expert on it, but it's something that I have revisited in my thoughts many times. But anyways, I'm just going to show you the book before I talk uh, too much about it. And that is Flannery O'Connor's um, Complete Short Stories. I'm probably going to read just a couple of these for Flannery O'January, which is something that Noah, along with a few others, are doing. Um, Noah at uh, Everyone Who Reads It Must Converse. And so Flannery O'January really inspired me to pick this back up. And I am particularly thinking about the story A Good Man is, is Hard to Find because I've never read that one. Okay, now we're gonna go into love stories, classics that are cent centered around a love story. So the first one is Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell, the uh, classic and controversial mammoth of a novel that is set in the American South that takes place during the Civil War and thereafter. And um, it, it's talking about the protagonist Scarlett O'Hara, Right? Isn't that right? Scarlett O'Hara and um, her unluckiness in love. And um, and I'm just, I've already set up a buddy read to read this in January, January and February. And I am just thrilled to finally sink my teeth into it. Next, we go from a mammoth to quite a slim novel. And this is James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, which is a, um, a gay love story. And I don't know much more than that, except for that it deals with morality and and what to do. Do you put yourself first or do you put the rules of society first? Um, 
and I might be really grossly oversimplifying that by the way but Giovanni's room was given to me to me by Sandy from Miss Reads a lot and I I haven't gotten to it yet so 2022 is when I'm going to start my relationship with James Baldwin okay the next one it was um is going to be it was um I talked about it on my Mooks and Grips bucket list book tag, which is a tag that I did about books I wanted to read before I died, and I got a lot of positive feedback about this, and it is Edith Wharton's House of Mirth. Um, this is about the, the fall of a society woman, but it is all tangled up in a love story as well, and so I thought it fit nicely in this category. Um, other than that, I don't know much about it. It's um, set in the 1870s in New York. So society, you know, high society and what that looks like. So again, I'm Edith Wharton. I'm, I'm very excited to meet her on the page this year. And then finally, something less dramatic, something less anguish, uh, anguishing or uh, angu filled with angst and anguish or perhaps even sorrow because I don't know what these books will uh, actually give me but something a little bit lighter, and that would be Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. This is a reread for me. I'm ready to jump into Jane Austen, this novel in particular, Pride and Prejudice, with myself having a more positive attitude towards Jane Austen. I've, I have had a up and down relationship with Miss Austen for years, and this year I really feel like I have taken steps towards having a healthier relationship with her, and so I want to revisit Pride and Prejudice with a more healthy mindset about Jane Austen. All right, the last set of books um, are that of female protagonists that deal with um, the, life, the life of females. Um, and that's really the only way that I could categorize it because uh, I, I couldn't find a thread um, they, you know, that would c connect these last four books. So the first one is Michael Cunningham's The Hours, which is about the protagonist Cassandra or Clarissa. Is that right? My goodness. Okay, so it is about <laughs> Clarissa, which isn't that the same name, exact same name as Mrs. Dalloway, um, Clarissa Dalloway, but this is, a, anyways, this book, let me, let me back up. I'm getting, I'm going down a side tangent. So Michael Cunningham was really inspired by Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, which I read earlier this year, and he wrote a, a, a book you, that was highly inspired by Mrs. Dalloway. So I wanted to finally read The Hours, which I've been meaning to read forever. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Again, a very, very modern classic, um, but I didn't want another year to go by without me picking up Michael Cunningham. So speaking of um, Virginia Woolf and Mrs. Dalloway, I'm going to continue my relationship with Mrs. Uh, with Virginia Woolf with To the Lighthouse. Um, I don't know much about this novel, but I'm sh I know that Virginia Woolf's style is that of stream of consciousness and the way that she approaches her work is to uh, really in, um, investigate the, our inner lives through the technique of stream of consciousness. And so um, I am sure or I'm certain that that style will pop up in this book to the lighthouse and I'm just very thrilled to get it. I got this from a little free library and it's in perfect condition. And I'm excited to continue my relationship with Virginia Woolf and deepen my knowledge of her and her writing. All right. Um, the next one is Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, which is set in the 1930s, and it is about a woman who is on this journey, journey to discover herself, but also um, use it, gets into marriages or relationships that are not good for her. Um, I've heard this called as a coming-of-age novel. I'm, I'm not sure because I haven't read it, but the themes that she talks about, Nor Zora Neale Hurston, is that of the ones that I have been circling around this year in 2022, and I want to continue to think about the themes of women in society um, and different voices of how women are presented in society and their exploration of themselves, and I've heard that this novel in particular has quite a bit of that in it. 
And then my final book, uh, def last but definitely, definitely not least, and that would be Beloved by Toni Morrison. I have yet to meet Toni Morrison um, on the page or, you know, out in the world, but I've, I've yet to meet her um, and her writing style, but uh, I'm, I'm tired of that. I want to, you know, I really want to get to her her writing and I thought Beloved would be perfect and I believe that this is full of sorrow and anguish and um, that of Toni Morrison style to be quite honest which is emotionally wrenching. Um, I don't know that much about it and I don't want to speak about it uh, in case there are spoilers but I know that Beloved has been calling to me and I don't again want more time to pass before I get to know uh, Toni Morrison's beautiful and yet a anguish filled writing. Okay, that is it. These are my 22 books for 2022, 22 classics for 2022. My goal again is to, as I've mentioned before, grow as a reader, to read what I have. Um, but also I thought this is such an interesting moment because you get, I get to capture this mood readerness in a video. And then in the future I can look back and I can be, I can critique myself or ponder as to why I chose these novels. Um, but mostly they were, they were the ones that I feel most excited to read, that have piqued my interest in some way or another. And here's the thing, I know that when I talk about them and I put this video up, my comments are going to be flooded with encouragement and excitement and buzz around these books. And so whenever I want to um, feel excited about this again, I can go back to this video and see the comments that I am assuming that I'll get about all of the excitement and joy um, and thrill of the anticipation of me reading these novels, which is such a, an interesting thing. Um, so yeah, so let me know, have you read any of these novels? Do you recommend any of these novels? Um, have, are these on your lists or what classics are, um, are on your lists for 2022? So let me know, I'm very excited about it. I'm, I'm just so excited that, uh, that this new year is here and that I have a plan in place. <laughs> Planning is quite fun. Um, and then I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm watching myself with some interest because I want to know, will I read these? How will I react to them? Will I get along with them? And these questions will be left unanswered until I actually get to reading them. So uh, stick around <laughs> on my channel if you wanna know how it goes between me and the classics. Um, but otherwise, I really want to know about you and your, uh, your journey with classics and where, where do you think your journey will take you in 2022? So that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so, so much for being here. And me and little Harry, we'll see you in our next one. Okay, guys? All right, bye.